Well, I think I, I actually don't think it was ever alive. What I think is fascinating about the history of autonomy and architecture is it's something we invented. It's something we came up with. It was always an aspiration. It was never an actuality. And as an aspiration, I think it still remains incredibly valuable. So I'm not. I'm not saying that autonomy is no longer a concern or an interest. I'm simply saying that it doesn't, in fact, exist in architecture. So architecture is a product of many hands and many forces working in the world in all kinds of wonderful and complex ways. And as we learn more about architecture and we learn more about um, how it goes together, um, all of the forces and actors needed to keep it together, um, both disciplinarily and also physically, uh, it becomes less and less satisfying to imagine it autonomous. Autonomous here meaning uh, um, um, uh, capable of giving laws to itself, right? If you go back to the root, the root of the word. Um, of course it isn't capable of giving laws to itself, nor is it able in the Kantian sense to somehow separate out a moral imperative from desires. Architecture is in fact um, in a very deep way about desires um, uh, and has never been able to separate an ethical or a moral imperative uh, from those desires and in fact it lives in the messy and uneasy um, and, and sometimes deeply troubling uh, intersection between ethics and desires. Um, at the same time the idea that there could be, and again I'm going back to Kant here because the autonomous project really began in the West with Kant, um, uh, the idea that there can be something in architecture as a kind of deeply compromised, deeply complex discipline that involves so much power and so much expenditure um, at the highest echelons of society, that there can still be something within that discipline that is capable of resisting threatening, challenging, revealing, undercutting those very forces that bring it into existence um, is, uh, still remains a promising one. And it still remains a generative one. And it's what I look for, like when I'm going through uh, student projects here at SIARC, when I'm looking at uh, uh, thesis projects, for instance, or when I'm looking at um, uh, uh, final projects for the semester um, in studio, it is what I look for. I look for something in that work that is capable of challenging the status quo. That desire on my part and the part of many other uh, um, theorists and scholars and historians and also practicing architects is, has been defined around the concept of autonomy. But I think it's really important for us to not take that as a given. The moment you start to say that architecture is autonomous, you've lost the potential of the idea. The potential of the idea is that it exists as an aspiration, that it exists as something actually impossible, um, that we should nevertheless still strive for, and that we should nevertheless reinforce and extend wherever we find it in whatever minuscule amounts. So I think there's, there's uh, um, this is where maybe a longer historical perspective is useful. Um, architecture is constantly striving to redefine itself relative to faster moving um, aspects of life. And even though we might think that architecture seems very slow relative to, to changing landscape of the digital and social media, et cetera, we should remember that it was every bit as slow in comparison to other forms of communication, even as far back as the Renaissance. So even though nowadays architecture seems very slow compared to social media, it also seemed very slow uh, compared to printing. Uh, and engraving and the circulation of images and the circulation and uh, proliferation of other forms of verbal communication like telegrams and then telephones and then TV. So there's, al there's always um, a kind of obdurate quality um, to architecture. It's got its own particular speed and its own particular duration. And those things, while they change, and actually they've accelerated quite a bit since, say, the Renaissance, um, still remain slow relative to other speeds. So in a way, I don't actually think that the, the contemporary presents some kind of existential crisis point for architecture. I do find it constitutive of the discipline that architecture always thinks that it's in crisis.
So one of the things that architects are always convinced of is that their moment is some kind of rupture and that their discipline is in crisis and possibly in danger of its very survival. If you go back through the, through the history of architecture, you see that over and over and over again. So I would say we'd be better off defining that as something that architecture always has and always bears and always uh, um, uh, uh, challenges itself with rather than some new condition. Oh, well, I mean, I think maybe uh, here uh, thinking about something like writing might be helpful. Um, so uh, we all write all the time because we have to. But there's a certain subset of writing that might, uh, that might amount to something culturally significant, literature, poetry, um, uh, certain uh, forms of uh, dramatic writing. Um, and I think the same holds true in architecture. So we build all the time. We're constantly making shelters uh, for ourselves and uh, for our things. Um, and there are, there are many different reasons why we build, uh, many different ways that we build. But certain of those become culturally significant. And who decides? Which of those becomes culturally significant? Architects. Architects choose. It's, it's what architects are talking about at any given moment in time that constitutes what architecture is at any given moment in time. And if uh, uh, something is no longer being discussed um, in architecture, it's not that, it's, that it ceases to become architecture, but it ceases to become important architecture. Yeah, I don't know. I think that uh, the, um, the academy, so if you, again, if you look at the history, so um, the academy was first formally developed to ensure a certain level of competence on the part of royal architects in France. France being the first kind of modern, centralized, strong state in Europe. Um, so from the beginning, the academy's role has actually uh, been twofold. On the one hand, to make sure that people knew how to bring buildings into the world in a sophisticated and competent way, and on the other, to make sure that there was some cultural value to what they were doing. So the, the Academy's role, I don't think, has changed very much. On the one hand, we still need to be responsible for adequately training architects to enter the profession, but that's the lower bar. The higher bar is to make sure that we are presenting and imagining architecture in such a way that we understand today in the contemporary moment, how architecture could have agency, how it could project itself more forcefully in the world. What are our opportunities now for autonomy versus where they were before? If we teach autonomy as if it was something that came and went, we've misunderstood its importance. And we've also given it a false historical solidity, um, which might result in an erroneous sense of tragedy. Right? Something that we never had to assume that it was lost seems meaningless to me. You know, one, okay, so one, so one thing that I, would, that I would put on the table, I've been thinking about this recently, and it's come out of um, being at SciArc, as I mentioned at the beginning um, of the interview that I'm relatively new here. The way that we talk about autonomy on the East Coast is very much um, as a historical project that's come and gone. And that's why I feel, I feel as though, um, in a way, your questions, um, and this is, this is nothing, no shade, um, but, uh, but one of the things, one of the, way, the ways in which your, your questions are phrased, it almost kind of presupposes that in a way. Like, can we, can we still talk this way or is this, this, this way gone, gone forever? And I, and I want to resist that a little bit. I think certain notions um, that seem to have the same generative potential as autonomy are uh, very much alive and kind of blossoming in, at SciArc um, and in the kind of broader uh, sphere of discourse that SciArc is affected by and affects. Um, and one of those uh, ideas that I've been interested in recently is the notion of discreteness. So discreteness is something um, that presupposes a certain um, resistance and a certain granularity to the architectural object, but also the architectural component. Uh, it seems to tie into uh, the desire for autonomy um, and the, uh, the, the the potential of autonomy, again, not as something that we, we ever achieved or that we could achieve, but something that we need to keep as part of what we think when we think what's disciplinarily possible with architecture. So I can think of two ways that this can go, and what would be really exciting for me in the future is if we could figure out how to bridge the gap a little bit. On the one hand, there's the kind of discreteness that Jose Sanchez talks about when he talks about many, many different discrete users um, and discrete uh, programmers interacting with architectural potentials in the form of uh, generative video games. So the idea that you could somehow imagine a new urban scape and new uh, city landscapes um, because you're able to kind of preserve the autonomy 
of the individual agents in a way that traditional architect developer models and traditional um, urban uh, planning models do not allow um, seems very productive. Um, so that would be kind of allowing uh, the populace to achieve a kind of resisting granularity that's useful. On the other hand, there's Tom Wiscombe's uh, understanding of discreteness in a, very, in a very formal sense, a certain set of conditions that if architecture um, engages with, uh, a certain sense of opacity, a certain sense of disconnecting from the, from the ground plane, for instance, um, a certain um, uh, a clash um, or tension between the inside and the outside, so these are all formal concerns, that also suggest a way of architecture retaining its status as a difficult object in the landscape. So what I would like to see, and what I would like to propose, is that these two projects that are running parallel but actually have no discourse between them at the moment find a way to come together, um, and that we start to think, um, instead of being overwhelmed by the speed and multiplicity of our digital landscape with all the different agents and all the different um, uh, vectors involved, um, both human and non-human, instead of feeling as though architecture somehow has less to say in that busy multitude, that actually we start thinking of ways that it can invade ever more expansive territories.